Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep it light, but I'm going to try and give you a, a good perspective about what it's like in Vanuatu uh, controlling cots. And before I move forward, I just want to acknowledge the, the list of people on the slide there. Um, it represents a, a bunch of people, mostly in Vanuatu, a um, couple from the government, Department of Tourism, and also Vanuatu Fisheries Department, but mostly they are from the Vanuatu Scuba Operators Association, who, um, uh, and I'll present some data on this, who have been uh, heavily involved in the cots culling in Vanuatu. So before I get into it, I just want to diverge a bit. And many of you know, uh, Joe and I have been working in uh, Vanuatu for quite some time. And we were fortunate enough to move to Vanuatu in 2018. And one of our favorite activities was to go snorkeling in this place here. This is called Havana Harbor. And I'll talk about this, this place again soon, but it's a beautiful place as you can probably tell. And that was our Sundays or Saturday and Sunday going snorkeling. We begin to notice more and more that there were cot scars and, and cots. And we started to learn that there was actually a, an outbreak emerging in this region during this time. So we were quite concerned about that. We managed to get some injector kits from the uh, Vanuatu Fisheries Department. And then our weekend became, as a family, doing cots culling, something for the environment. And we used to get visitors coming and we'd take them out and do the same. So this was great fun. And we made sure of it by finishing the day down the road at a beautiful restaurant overlooking Havana Harbour and watching the sunset. So why am I telling you this? Not to make you envious, of course, I wouldn't do that. It was a great lifestyle. But to give you a sense that this is sort of the way things operate when you're caught culling in Vanuatu, a place like Vanuatu. So I think this morning, I think it was Sheridan mentioned that 30 years ago, it was opportunistic. It's pretty much that way there and a bit ad hoc. Probably without the cocktails though. So this is Vanuatu. Now it's about two and a half thousand k's to the east of us here, it runs between approximately Mackay and the tip of Cape York. But what I want to show you in this slide is, <clears throat> is the extent of islands running north to south. So there's a lot of islands sparsely populated so mostly very isolated village style communities not high density living but very isolated and in the middle i've got not sure which is the pointer here we go so this is the island of afate where the capital is um, and i'll refer to that in a minute and that's got havana harbor on that island um, and port vila most of you would have heard and this is santo i'll refer to that again in a minute. So just to give you some local context, most people live really close to the coast. Most people go fishing. Most people rely on marine resources for their protein. And so, of course, healthy coral reefs are really critical, not just for livelihoods, including ecotourism, um, when it's not COVID impacted, of course, but especially for a subsistence lifestyle, it's, it's very important for health and well-being. So COTS represents obviously one, one of several key threats. There are others, of course. Another couple of things I should point out is that capacity and resourcing in Vanuatu generally is very low. And also the awareness and knowledge of cots is generally lacking, particularly in communities. And once you get out from the um, main population centers. So despite that, there has been some research in Vanuatu and uh, this was through um, IRD in New Caledonia, but in conjunction with Vanuatu Fisheries Department going back 2013 and looking for simple approaches they knew that oxbile was very effective but that's very expensive and it's very difficult to get into Vanuatu so they looked at different 
uh, simple solutions and tested lime juice and vinegar, like it's been tested here as well. And they found, <clears throat> as we know now, that 100%, it's 100% lethal within 24 hours with just a couple of shots of 10 mil, so 20 mil. So that, that's, that was great to know if you were going to be injecting in a place like Vanuatu because both are very um, readily available, lime juice and vinegar. Now, while they were doing this research as an outcome, they also came up with this great tool, a citizen science tool. So it's an online reporting tool for people to log in and just say, hey, yep, we've, we've seen cots here, um, we've culled this many or whatever. So a great tool. They also came up with uh, a start, at least, of a response plan. So based on densities, um, what you should do about when you should take action. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, because unfortunately that's where it stopped really as, as in terms of a, a framework and a response plan. So how do control efforts work? Well, they're primarily um, voluntary. In fact, they're all voluntary. Uh, they're mostly by the scuba diver operators uh, in places like Efate Island, where there, is new, where there are several. There are a few also on Santo. Apart from that, you really have, you have one on Tanner Island, and that's it. So these scuba diver operations, they've got a vested interest, but you know they're also passionate about healthy um, ecosystems. So they are the primary ones who have been doing culling. There's also some community groups, um, some communities, and some individuals, basically like us. Simple methods are the way to go. There is some, uh, has been some injecting in recent years because uh, injector kits were donated. But again, they've been mainly restricted to that one island of Afate. Uh, so it's mostly, and that's mostly uh, vinegar and, and lime. One, one lot has some ox bile, but again, it's not something that you can really get. It's mostly confined to scuba. So these scuba operators obviously can, can use scuba, but it's mostly confined to scuba. It's largely coordinate, uncoordinated, even though there are these numerous operators at various times. So ultimately it's generally ineffective, although there are exceptions, and I'll show you one in a second. So this is based on an effort around that research I talked about um, in 2013. It so happened that there was an outbreak in Santo Island at the time, and with just a little bit of funding, um, what was a significant outbreak, they were able to mobilise this community and remove 3.7 tonnes from one small area of reef in, in only a nine day period. So with small amounts of money, and I'm talking about small amounts of funding here, you can actually make significant efforts by mobilising these communities. Part of that is educating them, making them aware why it's important, why cots are a threat, and they will act, okay, because these are their, their livelihoods and their, their sustenance, like I said. I'm going to present this as some research that we've been involved with just doing benthic surveys on the main island of Afate. Um, I know everyone probably wants to have a close look at this and interpret it, but I'm going to do it for you um, for time. And essentially, just in the top left one, I just wanted to point out, this is the island of Afate. The top left is Havana Harbour, an enclosed harbour area that I talked about earlier. It's a fantastic, um, very beautiful, picturesque place. And to the north of that is Undine Bay. And basically what we saw during um, 2006 to 2009 in that Undine Bay area was an outbreak. And essentially what we found during these surveys 2015 to 17 was that recovery had been minimal. So we, we saw live coral cover as low as 5% in those areas, very high macro, macro algae levels. And I'll point out that in 2015, there was a category five cyclone that ran through that area, not far from there. Overfishing, 
particularly of herbivores, is a big problem in these areas as well. So these reefs are actually, they don't have a lot of resilience to deal with issues like cots. Conversely, those reefs in Havana Harbour during this period, which is just prior to the outbreak that I mentioned was emerging in 2018, we were seeing uh, live coral cover there higher than anywhere else in the, in the uh, Pacific region um, and even higher than 70%. So, and macroalgae was very low as well. So a really um, <coughs> almost pristine area in comparison. So unfortunately, as I said, there was an outbreak uh, began probably in late 2017 in that Havana Harbour region. So what, what I'm showing you here is we managed to get, uh, while we were in Vanuatu, some funding from the New Zealand Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade, which was essentially to try and, initially the interest um, came from them, or at least we approached them about having a strategic framework developed to uh, inform how culling should go about in Vanuatu, much like we've been hearing about the GBR experience. <clears throat> so in the meantime, they said, look here, here's some small amount of money to help you with the control efforts. So this is what we did. And we managed to then use some of that money to also collate the information from the scuba diver operators who had been mostly independently going out and doing culling at their sites. So that was really useful for us to do that. What you see here is essentially uh, reflective of effort, um, even though they did use uh, the funding to be able to go and explore other areas and come back to these main areas. So it, it sort of shows where the concentrations were during these uh, years. But um, again, it reflected their dive sites for the most part. I'm just highlight highlighting this area here I mean, we did see movement from Havana Harbour to the north down through this area, but um, this is actually the only World Heritage Site in Vanuatu in this region. Unfortunately, during COVID, the main operator for that region has not been able to go back there very much, um, also because he has a lot of um, boat problems. Uh, so I think he's nearly ready to go back there, so we haven't seen what's happened in that region, but essentially, we know there's been an outbreak. We have seen the damage um, the corals have caused during that, that, um, during that time in that region. Um, it's not been documented um, with a time series of surveys, unfortunately. The last we saw it was waning, perhaps, but again, we haven't been able, or at least the guys over there haven't been able to go back there for a while. Other areas that I, I showed on that last slide, um, near Port Vila seem to have higher numbers coming and going so it's not clear what's going on again we don't have enough information to say but certainly there are some hot spots in that main bay area and I I believe they've just got more funding from New Zealand to help with those controls to keep keep at it which is fantastic so as you can see, there can be some really strong efforts just from a small group of individuals, even at the community level, but there are obviously some issues remaining in, in a place like Vanuatu. There's an online reporting tool. It's a great tool. Unfortunately, not many people know about it, so it's not used very much across the entire country. Also, resourcing for the Vanuatu Fisheries Department to actually regularly access that information, collate it, and use the information in a, in a more strategic fashion, uh, even if there was a framework, they don't really have that, that capacity. So coordination and is, is lacking, and clear guidance about what to do with the information and, and how to respond to any further outbreaks is, is also lacking. And this is, this is a big problem because COTS, um, they don't seem to have been around in Vanuatu prior to, uh, I think they were first documented in about 1979, uh, or sorry, 1989. And anecdotally, 
they didn't seem to be remembered as being around prior to 15, 20 years to that. So that sort of suggests it's relatively new, but what we're seeing since then is more and more. So this is um, potentially a, an emerging or at least a, a growing problem for Vanuatu where generally the resilience of the reefs and the capacity of the, uh, the local capacity is low. So, so obviously it's clear that there's uh, a need for some sort of strategic response. And I think there's great opportunity here. So there are some elements that have been developed that the online reporting tool, tool is something that's a great um, tool, a great start that can feed into a system. They've started down the track of, of looking at densities and what, you, and what levels you need to have a response. They need to be revised, but they also need to be put into a framework that is um, gonna, gonna work for Vanuatu. So there's a couple of things needed here. Greater awareness, definitely. There's a lack of awareness and, and knowledge about COTS across the country and certainly about the threat they pose. I think that's growing, but that is, is still very much lacking. Obviously, the online reporting tool, I think it's a powerful tool, but, but only if people know about it, okay? And, um, and it's simple to actually use it, even for people in remote communities, but most of them don't know about it. The use of the database itself also needs to be strategic. Um, that's something that is, a, is an inherent problem, as I say, in Vanuatu and places like it, where resourcing is low. So to budget even just um, a small amount of time to accessing that information and, and to begin to use it uh, is lacking. So I think we can encourage that and incorporate it into something. So I think there's a great opportunity here with just a very simple system um, based on what we've learned from the Great Barrier Reef. Anything we do though, there are a couple of, couple of key elements that will be very, very different for a place like Vanuatu. Community involvement is critical. I showed you the, the extent of those islands and the isolation of many of those people. Well, the community is the only one available to actually do the controls. And most of that's gonna to have to be by bagging them. It has to be by manual. You can't get injector kits out to these communities and, and they'll break down within weeks or months, okay? It has to be by bagging, has to be manual. So it needs to be really simple and cost-effective in that respect. And the final thing is, it's a, it's a reality, but funding, external funding is necessary. And in places like Vanuatu, it's remarkable how even a small amount of money can go such a long, long way. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Thomas.